Okay, students, uh, welcome to lecture. Uh, happy Valentine's Day for everybody. Uh, we have some, some hearts on the screen. Uh, but enough of that tomfoolery. Let's get down to business. Uh, we're going to do some clicking here. Get your clickers out. I'm going to trot you through a calculation of the centripetal acceleration of the moon on its orbit. And it's going to be fairly close to what Sir Isaac Newton did. Now, we're going to use some data from NASA, so it's a little bit more accurate than what Sir Isaac Newton had, but uh, this law of universal gravitation that we talked about last time, uh, that he came up with, uh, superbly um, verified uh, theory, and we still use it to this day, of course. So uh, let's work out using clickers the centripetal acceleration uh, of our moon. Uh, and make sure that you take notes because we're, we're going to be doing clicker questions and I'm going to be going through every part of the calculation. So as we go, you'll, you'll also want to add it into your notes. It's going to be one of those kind of uh, clicker question uh, sets. Um, what I'm going to work with is information from the planetary fact sheet uh, from the NASA Space Science Data Center. Uh, the website's down here at the bottom. And there's a column here for the moon. Matter of fact, if you click the link at the top of the column, it takes you to the moon fact sheet, um, which has even more data than just this stuff on this first image. This is the this is kind of a summary data sheet for all the planets and the moon. Uh, but here's what the moon fact sheet looks like. And um, we're going to focus on this. Here's what we call the semi-major axis. It's the average distance um, of, the, uh, of the moon uh, from the center of the Earth. And, and, it, and the way that you read that is 0 0.3844. And then right here it says 10 to the 6 kilometers. So let me write that in kind of scientific notation. Zero, the radius that we're going to use for our circle, uh, 0 0.3844 times 10 to the 6 kilometers. And hey, you guys, a kilometer is the same as 10 to the 3 meters. So we're going to switch up to meters and get a bigger number for meters. So it's 0 0.3844 times 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 3 meters. And so that's the same thing as 10 to the 9. So go ahead and jot that in your notes. And if you're a little bit rusty with scientific notation today, uh, this will be a good workout for you in that um, extent as well. Because when you're working with... Um, uh, in the metric system with uh, planets and moons and stuff like that, you have to use scientific notation because um, if you're working with meters and seconds, now if you're using light years or something like that or light seconds, um, uh, that's a little different, but uh, you might not have to use uh, scientific notation. Here's the full, there's a official scientific notation. A whole number and then a decimal point, then a bunch of digits, and then some, times 10 of the something power, either positive or negative, and then meters. And what we're going to do with that is use that as our radius. And the, the moon's orbit is not a perfect circle, but it's pretty close to a perfect circle. You're shaking your head. You're shaking your head like you were dismayed. Everything OK? I mean, I don't want to go too fast or, you know, too bodaciously. Let me pause for questions. Yes. Because, let me go back here. Um, okay, there's 10 of the ninth right here. Okay. And then... Scientific notation is not supposed to have zero point something. It's supposed to be a whole number greater than one. 
less than nine, less than 10. So you have to have one point something all the way up to nine point something. And so we have to make this three point something, okay? 3.844, so we're moving the decimal point one point to the right, and that means you dip down to 10 to the eight, all right? And you know, I, you know, your calculator, if you know how to use scientific notation on your calculator, and you should try to learn how to do it if you haven't already. Um, your cal Yo, what is your name over, over there? Rachel. Okay. Wait a minute. You borrowed me your power cable last time? No, somebody else. Oh, okay. Um, somebody else over there. Yeah. I'm not done yet talking to Rachel. Rachel, um, this second or the third line down, 0 0.3844 times 10 to the 8, or times 10 to the 9. You could put that in your calculator, okay? And your calculator can handle it. The only person that can't handle that is a math teacher that's, you know, pedantic about scientific notation. They would say, oh, no, that's not scientific notation because it's, it's 0 point something instead of, you know, a whole number out front. Okay, now your question. 10 to the third meters up here is the same. I'm converting this kilometer into 1,000 meters, 10 to the three meters, okay? All right, let's keep going. Um, now, the second factor in the lunar data sheet here is the revolution period, 27.3217. Uh, you know, Sir Isaac Newton might have known it to that um, accuracy back in his day. And what this is going to do is get us a number of seconds. See, to figure out the centripetal acceleration of the moon, you want to calculate v squared over r. And to get v into some number of meters per second, we've got the radius in meters, and we want to go from days to seconds. All right, and that's a fairly easy calculation. Let's do that right now. And um, Rachel, we're going to do some more um, calculating here, but it's, we're not going to do any scientific notation until the very end. So here we go, 27.3217 days. All right, multiply that by 24. That'll tell you how many hours. This is for one full lap of the Earth, 360 degrees of orbit. Now multiply that by 60, because there's 60 minutes in every hour. And wait, there's still more. Multiply that number by 60, because there's 60 seconds in every minute. And when you do that, you get this ginormous number. And that is uh, 2,360,000. Two 594.88 seconds. And yes, we do know the distance and the period of the moon definitely to that accuracy. Probably more. They get, you know, they probably you know, have a lot more specific data about it. A lot more de de uh, decimal points. But this is still pretty good. All right. So here's our, here's our um, summary. Um, and... Rachel, what we're going to do here, uh, okay, here's my scientific notation for the radius, okay? And Robert McGuire, uh, over here in the second row is the period, and I just gave you that uh, whole number with a 0.88 seconds on top, and let's use 2.36 times 10 to the 6 for that um, into three specific figures, th three significant figures uh, for the period, all right? So we're doing a little bit of round off with that, not too much, all right? Now, how do you get the circumference of a, ra of a circle from the radius? You remember the formula for that? What's the formula for the circumference of a circle? Pi r squared? Incorrect. Not pi r squared. 
That's 2 pi r. That's 2 pi r. Pi times diameter or 2 pi times the radius. All right, so let's get it all put together now. All right, now get your clickers ready. And um, it's going to be um, a multiple choice question. And we're on frequency BB, so if you haven't used your clicker before, hold the power button down until the rectangle flashes, then type in BB. You'll get the go nitro message and then the ready message. All right, question number one. All right, you've got those numbers. What's the circumference of the moon's orbit in meters? I've got three answers here. Two of them are tempting. One of them is correct. All right, and I'll give you a minute to, do, to calculate that out. Switch this over to full light. What's that? Oh. I'll give one. Give one to. I don't really need one. Yeah, just. No, it's all right. Yeah, 2 pi times the radius. So you can do, you can do, the reason the scientific notation is helpful is you can do the calculations uh, longhand if you have to, if you use scientific notation. Otherwise, doing a longhand, you know, with uh, seven digits for your period and stuff like that, it would be a nightmare. Good. How many answers we got? 66. All right, let me give you another 45 seconds. And you just type it in a letter, it should automatically send it. 30 seconds. Fifteen seconds. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, I got 95 answers. Uh, yeah, this is good. Most of you got it. Go ahead and switch to presentation mode. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, let's try, um, and let's just review. For those of you that didn't get it, and for, for everybody, really, let's just trot through the calculation. Here's the circumference distance. So in one period of motion, 27 point blah, blah, blah days, uh, this is how far it goes. 2 pi times the radius, approximately. Uh, so that's 6.283 times 3.844, and then 10 to the 8. Now these two numbers here, are, uh, Rachel, are going to end up bigger than 10. So I'm going to have to change my, this is probably going to go to 10 of the 9 over here. All right, so let's work it out. Uh, yeah, 6.2 times 3.8, 24.15. Now I've still got it as 10 of the 8. Now if it was just me and I was grading a written exam and I looked at that answer, I'd say, okay, they got it. All right. But if you were going to click in the answer, I would say, all right, how many? I would ask you, uh, what's the distance in units of 10 to the 9 meters? Because you, it's hard to type in a 10 of the 9 on the calculator. And you don't want to type in all those digits. So what you would then do is 
go to this to you know move again Rachel move it one over but this time in the other direction and change the uh, the power of 10 to 10 to the ninth All right so there's your answer and uh, now that's the circumference now we're we want to get the orbital speed so the orbital speed is going to be that distance so go ahead and make a note of it this is your distance 2.42 times 10 to the 9 meters and it's going to take now what was that number 2.36 seconds 2.36 times 10 to the 6 all right there's your elapsed time for one lap so the next question is um what is your Oh boy, my picture is all blooped up. Mm. What is your um, orbital speed in meters per second? Go ahead and calculate. And this is multiple choice too. You have three options. Actually, you only have two options because one of them is 88 miles an hour. Superman can travel backwards in time. Everybody else has to go at 88 miles per hour to get the flux capacitor to flux properly. As everybody knows. It is quite commonality. Yeah. Flux capacitor. And again, you guys will go over the answer to this in detail. And it looks like a few of you are blooping it up. So um, we'll get you squared away here. OK, uh, 45 seconds. Go ahead and turn the lights all the way on. So we have a little bit of light on the subject. Okay, you guys are looking good. I love this. I love seeing you guys interacting and, and, and teaching each other and stuff, which, no, I mean, it's, it's lovely to see. I mean, as a teacher, it's something I love to see, you know, and hopefully you guys get it right. Okay. Oops. We're over time. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. How come you're all laughing now? Gosh. All right. Well, let's see what the answer is here. Um, turn the lights down, please. All right. Um, the answer, 1025. And if you do it a little bit more accurately with a little more, a few more digits, um, it's, it's a little bit smaller than that. But 1025 is pretty good. All right, so here's your calculation, 2.42 times 10 to the 9 meters on top. And a bunch of you, about a third of you, um, blooped this one. And, and you, you basically messed up your uh, scientific notation. 2.36 times 10 to the 6 seconds in the denominator. Okay, if you're doing it on paper and you don't have a calculator with you, here's how you do it. You take 2.42 divided by 2.36. And that you have to do by hand, like fifth grade, you know, long division. But then you have 10 of the 9 on top and 10 of the 6 in the, new, in the denominator. So that's a, that simplifies to 10 of the 3. All right? And so then you just do out the 2.42 over 2.36. And you come out to 10.25 times 10 to 3. And hey, you guys, either one of these is workable. 
right? So I might ask you, um, really, if I was going to ask you to calculate this on a test or a homework, I would say to the nearest meter per second. Uh, this number is not so big, not so small that I would give you, I would ask for, um, you know, to the nearest tenth of a meter per second or anything like that. All right. So there's V. Now we have to calculate V squared. All right. So now you make sure you write down the answer. Okay. 1025 meters per second for V. Now let's do V squared. This one should be easy. Now, on homework eight tonight, which is going to start at 11.50, right after class, just when we dismiss, uh, you won't have these calculations to do, but that's all right. We're doing them now, just so you have a feel for them. Uh, it's not the most important thing, but I want you to get your hands dirty uh, with working on this stuff. So uh, we're doing good. 30 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Good, 96 people answered. Um, correct answer is here, uh, 1.051 times 10 of the 6. Anytime you square 1,000, that's 10 of the 3. You square it, 10 of 3 times 10 of 3, that's 10 of the 6. This is the only possible answer. Uh, up here. The other ones are hopefully you spotted they were uh, way off. Anyways, here's the calculation. Go ahead and jot this down in case you got it uh, incorrect. Um, uh, 1.025 times 10 on 3 meters per second quantity squared. Okay, so 1.025 that's going to be 1 point something and it works out to 1.051 and then here's my Two powers of 10 to the third, or two factors of 10 to the third. 10 to the third squared is 10 to the sixth. So here's my full answer. And then to bring it down to four significant figures, uh, 10.51 times 10 to the sixth. All right. Now, a question. Yes. Ten point three. Yeah, it's ten of the third. Okay. Okay. Right. Another question. Okay, let's keep going. Here's the centripetal acceleration. Go ahead and jot this down. Now we've got V squared from the previous question and R from the earlier calculation. 3.844 times 10 to the 8 meters. Now I've got a 10 to the 6 and on top in the numerator and a 10 to the 8 in the denominator. So that means my scientific notation is going to be 10 to the minus 2 uh, depending on what I get from the, the numeric part over here. So 1.051 and 3.844, divide those out longhand or on your calculator. Uh, and that's a number less than one, so I'm going to have to fool around with my, uh, what you call it. Uh, anyways, this is the answer, 0 0.260 times 10 to the minus 2, or 0 0.0026 meters per second squared. That is the centripetal acceleration under the um, rounding off that we have done. 
for the moon on its orbit and assuming that the moon's orbit is a circle, a perfect circle. Now, in actuality, it's slightly elliptical, but it's pretty close to a perfect circle. So this is a pretty good um, approximation, and it was, and it's going to get us close enough uh, so that we can see how Sir Isaac Newton would have calculated this, and then said, "Whoa, this is pretty cool, right? 3,600 times g." So let's let's take the ratio now of g divided by that centripetal acceleration. Now make a note to yourself, this is Sir Isaac Newton synthesizing celestial mechanics, the centripetal acceleration of the moon, and terrestrial mechanics, the G for an apple falling out of a terrestrial tree. Right, so that was his idea. That's what makes it universal and it, it actually worked out pretty good. So here's the quotient, 9.8 divided by 0.00, .00 26 works out to about 3770. Now that's a little bit high. It's supposed to be a little bit closer to 3600, and it actually is if you do a little bit more careful rounding. So um, the ratio here uh, is that's pretty close to 3600. I don't, I'm not sure if that's what you know. I should be able to look that up. And, and look up exactly what number he came up with, but it's got to be close to that, 3599.6. That's pretty close to 3600, which is the square of 60, and the distance from the center of the Earth to the surface of the Earth is 1 60th of the distance from center of the Earth to the center of the Moon. So this is why um, Sir Isaac Newton made that uh, leap of intuition to say that the universal law, the law of universal gravitation was inverse R squared because of this. All right, now let me pause for questions before we continue. Yes? This formula is to show what tipped off Sir Isaac Newton he was able to calculate almost as well as we just did the centripetal acceleration of the moon on its orbit. All right? And so he was able to make a ratio like this because he already knew what the, um, what the value of G was. All right? And in, in Sir Isaac Newton's uh, uh, units of his day, it would have been in feet and seconds feet per second squared, but you know, for us it's 9.8, for him it's a different number. But um, So he was able to do this, and this ratio was very close to the square of 60. The 60 is the ratio of distances, earth, uh, center of Earth to the surface of the Earth, where the apple is, and then center of the Earth to the center of the Moon, where the Moon is. That's a ratio of 60. You know, the distance to the Moon is 60 times the distance from the center of the Earth to the surface of the Earth where the apple is. Right? So 60 squared and, and this ratio of accelerations were pretty close. So a lot of people think that that's why he came up with the idea of R squared in the denominator for uh, the law of universal gravitation. Another question. Yes. It doesn't. This is a dimensionless ratio. It's an acceleration divided by an acceleration. Okay? And so it's just 3,600. Pretty close. I mean, if you round it off to the nearest whole number, it's 3,600. Question? That's from our rounding off. This, is, this one is, it, you know, I, I redid the calculation with a, a few more digits. Okay? Yeah. So it's possible that he used a few more digits or rounded off differently than we did. <laughs> But, um, you know, I should be able to, his book, he probably has it in the Principia, except it's, you know, it's written in Latin, but numbers, of course, it, he didn't use Roman numerals, he used regular Arabic numerals. So. Another question. Yes. Nope, I can't. But you can go back to YouTube and, and look at it in a few hours. I never go backwards. We always go forward in time. 
possible. All right. Devin, ready to go? All right. All right. Now, I want to talk about the next topic for today, and that is collisions. Now, you can think of the two skateboarders up in the front as an interaction. You could think of it as a collision. You know, and what two skateboarders would do, you know, they would, if they were heading towards each other, they'd fend each other off and push each other off and end up going back the way they came. Um, and what we're going to do is uh, do a model interaction, slightly different from the skateboarders, but still governed by Sir Isaac Newton's laws of motion. And that's with um, a bunch of boxcars. All right. And we're going to work with uh, the momentum view. So we're going to compute the momentum state of the entire system of the boxcars. Here it is. I have um, four boxcars. Three of them are stationary. So this group over here to the right is stationary. And then this one over here to the left has a speed of 4.4 meters per second. And it's motating to the right. All right. Now it's going to ram into those other cars. That's how, you know, they put together a string of boxcars in the freight yard. Okay. And so here's the moment of impact. And if you think about it, um, the car on the left, the one that's moving, is going to slow down. It's going to be slowed down by the three, the string of three boxcars. By the same token, those three boxcars are going to start moving to the right. All right? So they're going to speed up a little bit. So there's a little bit of delta V going on here. And because of that, um, we're, you know, we're going to figure it out. Um, we're going to try to use momentum to figure out the final uh, state. And I'm going to call it V nu the final velocity, the new velocity of the group of four boxcars. And you know, boxcars, they're designed to be hooked together and then move off as one group. So that's, you know, that's a, a, a group of four boxcars. We're also assuming that this is in a level freight yard, which is what they try to do, and that the rails are balancing vertically upward against gravity downward so that the, um, there's no net external forces acting. The only forces acting are the interaction forces within the system of four boxcars. Okay, and that's an important point. And so, for instance, we're assuming that there's no friction. Now, the way that they design uh, the wheels on a railroad car and the way that they design the rails themselves they want to have very, very low friction. In other words, they don't make it, they don't make the surface of the railroad, you know, all gritty and sandy. They want it nice and smooth, but yet very hard. So it takes a lot of uh, pounding. Uh, so that's what they, they try to achieve that. Now, um, in this, I have a, a little animation here. Here's the boxcar moving in. Um, and it's got a velocity V1. Go ahead and make an arrow for that one to represent its initial velocity. Now, these other guys over here uh, to the right, the three boxcars here, make a note at rest or stopped or something like that. Right Now, they're not going to stay at rest. But until that boxcar number one on the left plows into them, they are going to be at rest. All right, and so let's um, compute now. Let's go back to our initial sketch. Let's compute the total momentum before the interaction. So this is P subscript I, the total momentum. And what we're going to do here is uh, we're, we're just going to calculate Anastasia the momentum of boxcar one, boxcar two, boxcar three, boxcar four. All right, now boxcar number one 
They're all 35,000 kilograms, just a round number that I dreamed up. That's approximately the right mass for, for a boxcar. Okay, so 35,000. And the first one is going 4.4. So P equals MV is 35,000 kilograms times 4.4 meters per second. Now the other ones, I have three zeros. Normally I don't write those down, but I went plus zero, plus zero, plus zero. And why am I allowed to do that? Write down the momentums as zero. They're at rest. Okay, so make a note of that. They're at rest, so those three momenta are zero. And the total is 154,000 kilogram meter per second, if you, if you multiply that out. Uh, better double check me on that. 35,000 times 4.4. Anybody verify? Okay, good. Now, we... No, or we claim that the momentum afterward also has to be 154,000 kilogram meters per second. Now I'm going to ask you a clicker question about why that is. All right, so get your clicker out. It's a multiple choice question. Here we go. Um, why must the initial momentum state of the box cars? P subscript I equal the final momentum state of the box cars, P subscript F. Why is that? Go ahead and choose one of the five. Th read carefully and think. Hmm. Okay, 20 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, good. Uh, go ahead and show that display. A little bit of uh, most of you answered C, and C is the correct answer. Uh, a significant fraction of you, however, voted for E. Go ahead and switch back to the laptop. And here's the correct answer. Now, I want you to look at, at E. Momentum is not always conserved. All right? If there's any kind of... And hopefully that should make sense to you. For instance... Um, a penny sliding across a table, eventually it stops. Its momentum is not conserved. Now, some of that momentum uh, actually goes into the, the tabletop, into all the little molecules that it slides over. Each of those molecules strips out a little bit of momentum as it passes through. That's how the friction works. And so it's transferred to the tabletop, but we usually don't think of the tabletop and friction forces as participating in the momentum. Although you can do it if you want, it's, it's not. But this is always true, that they exchange equal but opposite uh, momenta plus or minus delta P, whatever that, ha actually, we do know what, what, what it is, okay? The delta P is, uh, well, let's see, see what it's gonna be here. The total is 154,000 afterwards, P subscript F, 154,000 kilogram meters per second, and that's by conservation of momentum. Okay, that's the principle that allows us to say that if there are no net external forces, i.e. no friction, uh, then you're going to have some conservation of momentum. Now, the other thing, you know, we're trying to get the velocity of the string of four boxcars 
you know, v subscript nu. All right, we're going to do it. Here we go. First of all, we use the definition uh, of momentum to just say, okay, that's equal to mv of the new string of objects. You've got, it's like you have a gigantic boxcar of mass 140,000 kilograms moving as one object at, you know, some new speed, All right? So, so now this equation, let me move it up here, all right? This right-hand side is from the definition of momentum, and the left-hand side, P subscript F equals 154,000 kilogram meters per second. That's from conservation of momentum. And those now, if you look at it, you can solve for V nu. Okay, you just divide both sides by 140,000 kilograms. All right, here's what it looks like. Uh, 154,000 kilogram meters per second. That's my momentum value, final momentum. And I divide by 140,000 kilograms. Now, kilograms cancel top and bottom. And so you're left with meters per second. Good. Because right? that's what you want. You're trying to figure out a velocity. All right. Now, who's got... Anybody calculated that yet? 1.1. 1. 1. 1. 1.1 exactly. Anybody verify? 1.1? 1. 1. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, that's the correct answer. All right. so there's your final... Your final... Uh, velocity state. Hey, I have a question for you. What's the final momentum of boxcar 1? 1? 1.1 times 35,000. What's 1.1 1. 1 times 35,000? 38. 38,500. All right. So his final is 38,500. His initial was 154,000. So P, so his later minus earlier, his delta P is a negative number. Okay. And that signifies that he got a, a negative or leftward um, interaction force from the other three boxcars. It slowed him down. Question. Four box cars. They're all hooked together. They're moving as one. 35,000 kilograms each. Okay. And that's just the definition of momentum. Anytime you have an object, you know, its momentum is whatever its mass is. So four of these box cars identical, locked together, 140,000 kilograms, times whatever its speed is. And that's what we were trying to figure out its speed. All right. Another question. Yes. I just answered that on the other side of the room, okay? It comes from the fact that you have a, a string of boxcars down below, the final state. They're all moving off together. They're hooked together. That's how boxcars work. They hook together, you know, like, you know they, they come in and they hook together, and now they're moving off together. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's just 45, uh, 35,000 kilograms times however many boxcars are hooked together. Yeah, you hook another one on there. What is your name again? Melissa? Christine. Christine. Close. Okay. Um, okay, it's not. Anyways, Christine, um, if you hook another, you know, if, if you now send another boxcar in from the left, that would bring it up to 175,000, you know, after they collide. And, you know, and then you have some new speed again. And a new, new speed. Okay. And it'd be... 175,000 kilograms of mass. So. Another question. Yes, in the back. So, if you were to find the of the first box car, you would do 154. You would do its, its new momentum. For that box car only, 
It's 38,500. What is that? One thir 38, uh, go ahead. I, I haven't got it on the screen. 38,500 minus 154. Okay, so a negative hundred, a negative hundred and thirty-eight, thirty, forty-three, fifty-three. Okay, good. Okay, hundred, whatever she said, hundred, hundred fifteen thousand. Yeah, hundred fifteen thousand five hundred negatory. So that's his. De so what is your name? Aaron. Aaron. The delta P for him, he absorbed negative 118, no, 100, negative 115,500 kilogram meters per second. From, Aaron, a leftward push force and an interaction type delta T from the three boxcars. Okay? They absorb the same amount coming in. All right? And so now they're all they're all moving off at 1.1 meters per second. So it's kind of an interesting uh, interaction. And my wonderful students, we actually model. Um, you know, using skateboarders or boxcars or something, almost every physical interaction in the universe can be modeled in terms of momentum and exchange of momentum. Even in the quantum world, where we think of photons interacting with electrons to mediate the electromagnetic interaction, photons interacting with protons and quarks to mediate the electromagnetic interaction. Uh, yeah, it's all... It can all be understood in terms of momentum. Now, I want to, um, and, and here's the, the, I believe this is a quote from the textbook. Total momentum of a group of interacting objects remains the same in the absence of external forces, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, okay, I have another clicker question for you, and it's to calculate the momentum of another set of boxcars. And this one's numeric, so hit the... Um, Refresh key on your calculator, on your uh, clicker, and now you're going to type in a number, something point something, and then hit the send key. Here we go. Different initial state, 6.4 meters per second. All right. Thank you for turning the lights on. So take your time, calculate carefully. And give me the final, oh boy, this is a typo. It should be, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't change it um, midstream. It should, it should say, type in your, I thought I changed it, sorry. Type in your answer to the nearest 0 0.1 meter per second of speed. E.g. if your answer is, boy, this is all messed. This, this yellow thing is, but we want to find the new um, V nu. You know, something point something. I'm real, I think I'll, I'll try to modify that on the podcast, on the, on the YouTube before I publish it. So type in your answer to the nearest 0 0.1 meter per second of speed. And then hit the send key. All right, and I can see that you're... All right, good. So take a minute to do that. And hey, you guys, for homework eight tonight, which will start up in about uh, 30 minutes, you'll be able to You have another boxcar question similar to this so hopefully you'll crush it tonight you know what i think i did i i did the i corrected the one in the homework but i did but correct this, this one. i didn't okay. fix this one so meters per second of speed which people are definitely clicking in here so you guys are doing good
I was about to say Gesundheit, but he was drinking his pina co yeah. his, his coffee. His coffee. The speed to the yeah speed to the nearest point one. Okay, forty five seconds. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Did you guys get it? All right. Zero. All right. Um, yeah, most of you got that. Uh, 1.6. That's good. Uh, so you'll have uh, another chance to mess around with this on homework eight uh, later on. All right, next topic. Um, from the momentum view of interactions, now we're going to take a look at this idea of uh, space-time, four-dimensional structure of uh, our world which people had thought about, but Einstein is the one that really figured out um, how it all works. So let's talk about that. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a big topic. Uh, in the four-dimensional view of the universe, um, there are three spatial dimensions, X, Y, and Z, and then there's one temporal dimension, T, or time. And the three spatial dimensions look like this. Okay, so for instance, if you're looking at the lectern up here in the front, you know, the, the, y, the, the y or the z coordinate could be going up this way, and the x coordinate could be going up the aisle, and the y coordinate could be going left and right. Okay, or any other, uh, you know, orientation of x, y, and z axes is fine. So this is one of them. All right. So those are the three spatial dimensions, X, Y, and Z. Another way to think about a spatial dimension um, not in X, Y, Z coordinates. Let's go ahead and jot this down. I was actually thinking about this morning before I got out of bed. Let's see, I'm trying to stay one step ahead of you guys. So I've got to th start my day thinking. All right. Now I was thinking about this. In three dimensions, you can take a spherical view of the coordinates. These ones are what we call rectilinear coordinates. In other words, they're at right angles to each other. Um, but you can take a curvaceous view, a spherical view. And um, one way to do that is simply to think of a satellite, you know, the position of a satellite at a given instant of time. So uh, a satellite is going to be above a certain point on the Earth, the surface of the Earth, somewhere. And that point on the surface of the Earth has a latitude and a longitude, right? You know, everything on the surface of the Earth has a latitude and a longitude. You know, so the latitude is, um, you know, how far north of the equator it is or how far south of the equator. And then longitude is how far west of Greenwich, England, or how far east of Greenwich, England you are. And then the international date line is about 100 degrees west longitude, or 180, excuse me, 180 degrees west longitude, 180 degrees east longitude from Greenwich, England. Uh, so latitude and longitude, so those are two uh, curvilinear coordinates, we call them, spherical coordinates, latitude and longitude. And then the third spatial dimension in a spherical view, would be just the distance from the center of the Earth. So that would be the radial coordinate, R. All right? And so that would be another way of having three spatial dimensions. 
latitude, longitude, and r, the radial distance from the center of your coordinate system, which if you use the Earth as your center of your coordinate system, you know, it'd be latitude, longitude on a map, and then um, distance from the center of the Earth. Now, um, the dynamical quantities um, that encode interaction and potential for interaction um, are, are the following. Momentum. Momentum is the um, mass times the spatial velocity. A spatial velocity, the x component of the velocity is delta x over delta t. You know, how fast are you going along the x-axis? The y component of the velocity is delta y over delta t. How fast are you going in the y direction, if any? And then the z component would be, you know, how far are you going delta z over delta t? All right, so you could, you know, and, and what we normally do is we're usually working in two dimensions, but we could work in three dimensions if we chose to. The formula for that is P equals MV, the mass times the spatial velocity. So what, so spatial velocity, three components, spatial momentum, three components. What's the fourth component? Well, it turns out that the fourth component in the dynamics of every object in the universe is energy. The famous example of that is E equals mc squared. That's known as the rest energy. And that's one of the, Einstein's most famous formulas, E equals mc squared. But there's many other forms of energy. Uh, and what we're going to do is study those different forms of energy. For instance, you may have heard of kinetic energy. Okay, the energy of motion. We're going to study that. Uh, and you may have heard of uh, thermal energy. You know, like... Um, from a geyser or a volcano, right? We're going to study that, the, the heat, uh, the, the energy that's composed of heat. And there's an electrical energy, you know? You know, how does it, how, and, and that electrical energy is, is basically everything that you have um, works on electrical energy, your phone, your body works on electrical energy. You know, all the biological molecules in your body, even the water, they're all held together by electromagnetic interaction of protons and electrons, nuclei and, and electrons. And that's all electrical. And when you get energy from food, you know, you, you eat a sandwich and then you burn those calories by, you know, swimming the lap, laps in the pool or do the stair machine or whatever it happens to be. That energy that you get from the sandwich comes from the electrical bonds in the molecules. of Because you can't, you, your body is designed to get energy from proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. Okay? It breaks it down, and then it turns it into adenosine triphosphate. And then that's what your cells actually use. So it's kind of, oh, that's what we do, and it's all electrical. Okay? You know, and, the, and you use electrical force in your muscles to defeat gravity. You know, when you walk up a stairs, gravity is working against you and you defeat that. It's, it's kind of impressive to think about. Your muscles are, are maybe half the biggest person here, the tallest person has a muscle, maybe their quadriceps or maybe uh, one of their back muscles, um, maybe a quarter of a meter or a third of a meter in length. And with that muscle, and a few more like it, you defeat the earth, which is uh, thousands of kilometers in diameter. You defeat the gravi gravitational pull. In other words, you go up the stairs. And even a little baby could do that. All right? That's all electrical. All right? And that's in the, and, and so in, in terms of the, the four dimensional uh, nature of space time, yeah, momentum and energy. Uh, we treat them actually in a similar way. So here's the, here's the vector statement for momentum. Spatial components, Px equals m times Vx. 
PY equals M times VY. PZ equals M times VZ. Or just the vector statement above in large letters with the little arrows. That means the same as the lower three equations. Those are like sub-equations. And here's what the... Here's what I work with as a theoretical astrophysicist. When I'm working on black holes and stuff, and the early universe, the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, um, this is how I have to think. Okay, My positions, um, I usually use the first component as time, and then three spatial position coordinates. All right? So my time is first, and then x, y, and z. And then for energy momentum, I have one single four-dimensional vector. And energy, whatever form I have, is up here in the very first slot. Now, we call time the fourth dimension, but usually, in astrophysics anyways, we make it the first dimension and let the other ones fill out the rest of the four dimensions. But you could do it the other way. Some guys, uh, some scientists park time as the fourth one. You know, in other words, at the bottom of the column. And energy at the bottom of the column. And you can certainly do it that way. But this is how we do it in theoretical astrophysics. So if you're, if you're trying to blow up a black hole or something, you've got to work in these terms. This four-dimensional vector on the right, the energy momentum vector, encodes the interactions and the potential for interaction of an object or a system of objects. The space-time position tells you where in time and where in space an actual event is. All right. And so when we talk about four dimensions, this is what we're talking about. Now, on Thursday, we're going to talk some more about uh, energy. And before you get to that, I want you to Hack through homework eight. Wow, we're dismissing early today. Wow. Nice. 11.35. Uh, hack your way through homework eight. It's due Thursday, and it'll activate in about 15 minutes. Okay, you're dismissed. See you on Thursday.